The following episode is sponsored by Audible, one of the leading providers of audiobooks online. This summer, the summer of 1916, Belgian, British, and South African forces did a fairly good job of taking territory in German East Africa. They even captured the Dar es Salaam Railway, which cut off most connection with Lake Tanganyika, which made up the bulk of the western border of the colony. But you know what? For months before that, some seriously bizarre and interesting action had been going on on the lake itself, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about the battle for Lake Tanganyika. There was a series of naval engagements between German, British, and Belgian naval forces for control of the lake. It went down in late 1915 and the first half of 1916. German East Africa was surrounded by Belgian, Portuguese, and British possessions. And if Germany was to hold on to the colony, they kind of had to hold the lake, which controlled the border and would allow raids and the quick transport of troops while preventing the enemy from doing the same. However, to control the lake, Germany would need armed vessels on the lake, and when the war broke out, she had none. But when the British attacked Dar es Salaam, August 8, 1914, the Germans scuttled an armed survey ship they had there and sent its guns and crew to the lake, arriving in Kigoma on the lake's eastern shore the 12th. Captain Gustav Zimmer became German commander of the lake region. In addition to the many tiny craft on the lake, Germany had the 45-ton Kingani the 60-ton Hedwig von Wismann and was constructing the 1,200-ton Graf von Goetzen, which had actually been built once already in Poppenburg in 1913, then taken apart, packed in 5,000 crates, sent to Dar es Salaam, then westward as far as possible on the railway, then carried by porters to Kigoma. It was assembled there and eventually launched June 9, 1915. The Germans had already established control of the lake, though, in 1914, putting the Belgian steamer Alexandre del Commune out of action and sinking the British Good News and Cecil Rhodes. They now had the only two working steamers on the lake and were undisputed masters. The Belgian commander in the area requested airplanes, a sub, and torpedo boats to fight back. He got a torpedo boat, but no torpedoes, and four airplanes from the British Admiralty, but they wouldn't arrive until May 1916. In April 1915 came a plan to give the British control of the lake. A professional hunter named John Lee, who knew the lake region well, traveled from South Africa to Britain with a proposal for the Admiralty. He wanted to send two motorboats, faster and better armed than the Hedwig and the Kingani, to change the balance of power. This is kind of easier said than done, but Lee had worked out the overland route to get the boats there and the general logistics. British Admiral Sir Henry Jackson said, It is both the duty and the tradition of the Royal Navy to engage the enemy wherever there is water to float a ship. Two suitable boats were found, 40-foot, twin-engine boats fitted with three-pound Hotchkiss guns at the front. Okay, enter possibly the weirdest guy of the whole war, Lieutenant Commander Jeffrey Spicer Simpson, the oldest Lieutenant Commander in the Royal Navy. He had been suspended twice for incompetence, but he was the only guy available. He was also a serious braggart and invented fantastic lies about himself. He also wanted to name the two boats Cat and Dog, but the Navy wouldn't let him, so he christened them Mimi and Tutu. Really? The expedition departed London June 15, 1915, and arrived in Cape Town July 2nd. En route, Spicer Simpson regaled the other passengers with his fraudulent exploits in Africa and the Far East, like shooting rhinos on the Gold Coast, where there are no rhinos. He also threatened to commandeer the ship when he was told not to smoke near the gasoline engines. When they got to Cape Town, the boats were carried by railway as far as Fungarume in the Belgian Congo. The next stage was the tricky part. 240 kilometers overland to Sanikisia, with heights of up to 2,000 meters in the Mitumba Mountains. Lee had gone in advance to prepare the way, and a track was being cut through the bush. 
and bridges to cross the 140 rivers and gorges on the way were being built. Lee had also brought in a tractor engine from southern Rhodesia to drag the boats and supplies from Fungarume. And moving just a few kilometers a day, they reached Sanakisia September 28th, my birthday. Yes, I am 149 years old, and I look good. Anyhow, from there, they were either taken by rail or floated along to the Belgian harbor Lukuga on Lake Tanganyika, arriving December 23rd after a six-month journey. Spicer Simpson insulted the Belgians and promptly began wearing a skirt, not a kilt, a skirt, and bare arms and shoulders, which were covered in tattoos of things like snakes and butterflies. The ships went into action three days after arriving. The Kingani was spotted, and Mimi and Tutu gave chase. The Kingani didn't realize the danger it was in until very late, and it tried to turn to bring its forward gun to bear on them. This didn't work. Mimi was faster and attacked from astern, and Tutu did from port. The Kingani tacked from side to side to try to use its gun, but the British ships were too agile. Eventually, the Kingani took a few shots, was rammed by Mimi, its captain was killed, and it surrendered. The whole action had taken 11 minutes. Once ashore, Spicer Simpson told everyone he had personally fired the crippling shot. He hadn't. The British repaired the damage to the Kingani and renamed her Fifi. Mimi, Tutu, and Fifi. Fifi's front gun was moved to the back, and at the front, she was outfitted with a big 12-pounder gun. The Germans did not investigate the Kingani's disappearance until early February 1916, when Zimmer, sailing in the now-completed Götzen, which the British didn't know about, ordered the Hedwig to find her. By this time, Spicer Simpson was a full commander, though the locals called him Lord Bellycloth. The Hedwig was then spotted off Lukuga. Fifi and Mimi attacked and the Hedwig tried to run, but Mimi was too fast, though Fifi fell behind, being burdened with the 12-pound gun. Mimi kept up harassing fire while the Hedwig tried tacking to try and use its front gun, and that allowed Fifi to catch up. The chase lasted three hours until Fifi could finally close range and open up with a 12-pounder, eventually hitting the Hedwig's boiler. The Hedwig's captain had the ship scuttled. Spicer Simpson stopped to pick up a floating locker before picking up survivors. Inside it was the German naval ensign, the first one captured by the British in World War I. The day after all of this, Zimmer went out to see what had happened. When Spicer Simpson saw the Götzen, many times Fifi's size and much better arm, he turned around and went back to bed. Yes, he went back to bed. He realized he needed something heavier to fight her. The Belgians were building the Baron Danis, which could have challenged the Götzen, but it was taking forever. So he went in search of another ship, returning from Leopoldville in May. During his absence, the Götzen's guns were removed since the German land forces needed them. They were replaced with wooden dummies. Now, Spicer Simpson wouldn't attack since he didn't know the guns were dummies, and Zimmer couldn't attack without guns, though on June 12th, those four planes I mentioned finally made their appearance, bombing the Götzen but causing only light damage. When the Dar es Salaam railway was captured in mid-July, Zimmer was ordered to leave the lake. He scuttled the Götzen, and the Belgians occupied Kigoma, July 27th. The battle for the lake was over. Belgian King Albert awarded Spicer Simpson the Croix de Guerre, but when the truth of his performance reached the British Admiralty, he never held a naval command again. We will definitely do a special on this nutcase, but go look him up, because I have barely scratched the surface of his antics. But give him some credit for a contemporary writer did write this. No single achievement during World War I was distinguished by more bizarre features than the successfully executed undertaking of 28 daring men who transported a ready-made navy overland through the wilds of Africa to destroy an enemy flotilla on Lake Tanganyika. That, I think, says it all. I talk every week of the horrors of the trenches and the gas and the death and destruction, but I thought this week I'd give some time to one of the perhaps lighter side stories of the war. If you're wondering, the British raised the Götzen in 1924 and relaunched it as the Liemba in 1927. That's a local name for the lake. That ship 
is still in service today, working as a commercial and passenger boat. From what I understand, C.S. Forster used the story of the battle as the basis for his novel, The African Queen, and you've probably seen the movie version starring Humphrey Bogart. This episode was sponsored by Audible, one of the leading providers of audiobooks online, and it's a great way to listen to some of the best audiobooks when you're on the go, like on your smartphone or your tablet. And it is perfect, in fact, for my regular jaunts from Stockholm to our fantastic studios here in Berlin. Now, they have a lot of great audiobooks on the First World War, but, you know, talking of the Battle for Lake Tanganyika, of course I'm thinking about The African Queen by C.S. Forster. If you go to audible.com slash thegreatwar, you can sign up for a 30-day free trial and get The African Queen narrated by the great Michael Kitchen or any other audiobook for free. And the cool thing is, even if you don't like the service in the end, you can still keep the audiobook. We'd like to thank Dave Hunter for the research on this episode. If you want to know more about the African theater of World War I, you can check out our episode about German East Africa right here. Do not forget to check out the great Audible catalog at audible.com slash thegreatwar, and also do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.